in your notes of preaching and you will have both the triumph and the passion and the marks of true biblical preaching. Any question on these two secondary significance of the cross? Again, I cannot overstate the point that this is secondary to the primary when we make it our central focus to preach the cross in its primary significance, then we can preach and teach the secondary significance of the cross. And that's what we have done today. Any question? Anyone in person, you can use the video or chat. Again, introduce your nickname plus church. After consideration of the cross or the significance of the cross of Christ, we will be considering next the extent of the atonement, a controversial one, and we'll have several lectures on that. From Joshua, what is the danger of treating signs and wonders as normative even today? Because it is a misunderstanding of the purpose of signs and wonders. The very word sign is reminding us that signs and wonders are functional. What is the function? To authenticate revelation. Now, this is not the time to belabor that point, but to simply assert that signs are to authenticate revelation. When revelation was completed, which it happened when the scriptures were complete, there is no more place for signs and wonders. And in fact, the Bible does tell us that the the signs are apostolic. Second uh, Corinthians twelve verse twelve calls it the signs of an apostle. Uh, so the signs were for the apostles themselves mainly, and then for the apostolic period secondarily. But after that, there is no more need for signs and wonders. Now that does not mean. Let me explain that we do not believe in miracles today. We do. Because God is a God of miracles, He can do things outside of providence. But there are no more miracle workers among Christians. We all depend upon God's power, whether He does it miraculously or more often providentially. It's not us who perform miracles at will. So that's our... Yes, good morning, I... Paul. Yeah, good morning, Paul, and good morning, brothers. I don't know if this is a correct question, but uh, I should mention that the judgment vans in the cross. Uh, but Satan is a thing at this point, meaning how could we best explain that, uh, given that God in his sovereignty uh, Satan is already judged, meaning he can prevent Satan from wielding his influence, but yet he still allows him to do his stuff. So, uh, is it like a, a parabang forbearance pa yun, or I don't know. That's why I said, is this a right question or not? No, it's not forbearance uh, for Satan or demons. Uh, it's permission. Uh, in the same way that the judgment was advanced on believers, so we are guaranteed that there is no more condemnation. In the case of the devil, it's quite different because he is judged. It is guaranteed that he will have his damnation. Uh, in our case, it's the reverse. Because of the judgment on the cross, uh, Christ acted as substitute. So we have no more condemnation and there is no damnation awaiting us for believers. In the case of Christ, the judgment advanced on Christ meant that the judgment on Satan is guaranteed. He is a judged ruler. He is an, a defeated enemy, but still permitted to prolong the struggle. And uh, whatever the reason of God, we know that it will derive more glory to God. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Other questions?